right, awesome. Okay. So we so, have some you know, Eichmann questions because we feel like um, even though there, there's so much uh, that just happens, but it all seems to revolve around one like center. And I feel like that center is the Adolf Eichmann case. Um, so we just like right. to like ask some questions about that. Right. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so just a more personal question, I, I would say. Uh, so how did the trial in its end impact or affect you? Well, you know, Eichmann was declared guilty and there was, which was, everyone assumed he would be, but you understand what the tension was about was the horror of what he had done. And he sat there, sort of the photos of him, if you ever see the photos of him at the trial, there's almost no smile, no reaction, no anything, just, no just, just a guy in a white shirt. He could be a guy with a briefcase and a hat and a white shirt, some lawyer walking down Wall Street. I mean, he, you know, he looks like, like a regular little, little guy, small guy, not very important. Uh, he, of course, took this, the position that he, the famous defense was that he followed orders, you know, that was hit not only his defense, but many of the Nazis. Um, yeah. Um, yeah and I think that's like a big he thing. was declared guilty. The, the sentence came later and there, there was a lot of concern about what to do because they did not want there to be a grave because they were sure that if there was a grave, Someone some right about. wing neo-Nazis would ultimately Dig start up. making it a political shrine. Yeah. So he was hung and then cremated and his ashes were thrown in the sea. It's the ultimate irony. At first they cremated the Jews, the gypsies, the homosexuals, everyone that they deemed impure. And then even with the Nazi officials in the Nuremberg trials, hung and cremated. Just as exactly. they did too. Exactly, exactly. They didn't want any shrines. They didn't want any any, any remnants. Right? There are always people who will, we know of this in America, you know, I won't name names, people who's, who really, whose graves became shrines for right-wingers and et cetera. And, and the Israelis didn't want that. But there was a lot of tension over that. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you, you asked me, uh, I think about, was it only the Mossad that was involved? It was largely the Mossad, although I remember reading, but I'm, I can't give you a full answer on this, but I do remember reading that um, the famous Nazi hunter, Simon Wiesenthal, he he helped the Mossad in certain ways with the Eichmann case. Uh, maybe some contacts he had, I don't know. He wasn't involved in the Argentina action, but he was involved somehow in that case. Oh, well, in that case, that answers that other question about whether independent Jews tried to hunt down Eichmann uh, themselves or not. It was yeah. really the Mossad, the Mossad. And don't forget, they, I mean, if you've studied how they got him out of there, I mean, they had in their, they all dressed as crew. They, they dressed as the crew of the plane, including Eichmann. He was dressed as a crew. But they had with them one of the world's most brilliant anesthesiologists who injected a, a medicine into Eichmann, which would be just enough to make him woozy, but still enough to have him be able to walk on the plane. They had, they, you know, this was, this was, was some... going to happen. They were not going to make a mistake. Yeah. Wow. And that just oh. for, just for those that don't, uh, that may not know what the Mossad is. So it's the Israeli organization that's very similar to the CIA. So it deals with uh, international affairs. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. So, <clears throat> building off of Eichmann and his trial, so how much did you have to research prior to making the novel, or did you just get a lot of knowledge just from your travel? Um, yeah. I get a lot of I mean, I, as a journalist, I'm a researcher. Okay, so even when I go to an art exhibit and I see an artist's work, I go back and I see all the reviews they've done for the last 10 years and all the art they've done. It's my nature. Uh, I think it may be related to that PhD I have in English. <laughs> it could it could be, you know, they, forced, they do make you learn how to be a researcher. So I read a lot. I read a lot of the papers. I read a lot of the trials. I read the commentary. I read newspapers. Um, did I read everything? One could never read everything that's been written about Eichmann. I mean, and so many books and so many things, but I read a lot. Uh, I did not, I didn't want the book to focus only on him. I wanted him, I wanted the book to sort of bounce off him. Yeah, to bounce, yeah. It seemed to like bounce off like, his evil. Yeah, it, it seemed like he was kind of just like, a centerpiece that everything revolved around, but really what right. revolved around it had the most attention, kind of Correct. just like Correct. how, yeah, yeah. Correct. Like, the, the like foundation it, of it all. It, there was a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's a mystery, but it's a, it's a, a lot of people change. Ruth changes, Ezra changes. Yeah, like the story Susan itself changes. is like. Yaakov changes, Susan's father, Yehuda changes. Okay, okay, there are a lot of, there's a lot of change. A lot of catal- it's a catalyst really for the growth that all of these. It is, it is. Yeah, and like it's it kind a, of like. It's a kind of an evil catalyst for good. Yeah. It is a catalyst nonetheless in order to grow and develop. Yeah. Yes. I really like that, an evil catalyst for good. Um, so. Yeah. On to our uh, final question regarding Eichmann and the trial. So, just to a broader non-Jewish audience, uh, which is important because as a podcast, we're trying to reach as many people as possible because it is ultimately important information. It is historical information and it is information that we should all know. Uh, What do you think is the significance of this trial to that broader non-Jewish audience? Uh, I think We often learn things in history. We get them out of books and we don't always get them right. I mean, I'm old enough to remember all of the erroneous things about the Civil War that were in my social studies books. Lots of things. And even World War I. Uh, So, I think Holocaust deniers and, and people who know who are not Jewish, of course they ask the question. And I understand this question because as I told you, the Jewish children ask this question. How could this happen? How didn't six million people rise up and rebel and kill him. And I think it's important to know this because evil doesn't always go away. In every generation, in, in sk- varying in scale, varying in countries, People are brutal to people. People kill people. Russians kill Ukrainians. Ukrainians kill Russians. Iranians yeah, kill others. I think, like we, we have such, the like Turks a false pre- are fighting with others. Armenians for one. Exactly. So I think what's to learn from the Holocaust is that we can all be blinded to evil and that we have to 
kind of learn from it how not to be, how to how to be brave and how to keep our eyes open and how not to be fooled by all kinds of stories. I mean, really all kinds of stories. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think totally I guess agree. that's my and I think, question. And I think like um, on top of that, like like a lot of people nowadays, you think because of like the modernity we're facing now or like how like recent times are that such an atrocity can't occur because of how like sophisticated our society is. But like right. at the end of the day, like that's, that's not necessary. That's not, not only is that not necessarily true, that's not true at all because um, not only are such atrocities currently occurring in other parts of the world, um, if you look back in Germany, Germany was one of the most advanced societies of that day, and, and that event still occurred. It um, was. But, but even if you think about this, uh, talking about atrocities, even the scale, we live in America. There are gun murders every other week. School shootings. Okay. Yeah. You know, supermarkets and schools and churches, etc. So where is that coming from? And how are we to understand it? And and how are we not to be blind to it? And how are we to do anything about it? Nobody's putting us on the cattle cars the way the Nazis put the Jews. But we're here, living here, and good people are getting killed. So it's still around. And understanding that is, I think, the root of all social activism. That happened then, that happened now, that will happen. Exactly, uh, yeah. exactly. I think, I think, you know, some people say, oh, you know, activism, it doesn't do anything. Either. But ultimately, it does something and you have to keep at it and you have to keep engaging younger people to understand this. So um, I'm hoping that maybe people reading my book will get that universal quality. Yeah, yeah, for that's, sure. That's what, I, um, that's what I had in mind. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think we definitely picked that up and like, uh, speaking of the book, before we dive into the book-related questions, I want to say, like, um, like it, it kind of, like, aside from your experience in actual Israel, like, you could also kind of, like, see that, that you, you've done, like, research before as a journalist, because, like, it kind of reads, in, in a good way, like, a, a literature review in terms of, like, how the Eichmann case, like, kind of culminated in how you synthesize, like, so many different sources um, to create, like, this case and it's kind of like neat because it's like it's like a literature review which is usually very objective um the most objective of all it's like the non-fiction of non-fiction um and you kind of I, I, I it. It. So, let's face it let's face it i've done a million non-fiction stories and i'm a journalist okay and the answer to your question is i think i'm a pretty good researcher so but i wrote this as a novel but that doesn't mean that I could eliminate from my psyche the journalist. Yeah. I, I could. I yeah. could. I can't. Okay. okay. I can't. Yeah, yeah. We definitely picked there up was on a that. Lot of, a lot of people sure that I was on the right street and the right this and the right that. Yeah. Um, and now, like, diving into the book-related questions. We only received one copy, so... And Oz and I exchanged since we had the book for, like, two months, so we were both able to read it, but I have the book for now. But we, uh, Yeah, but we both were able to find certain uh, points that we both agreed were uh, very significant, or at least very uh, not noteworthy. Sorry. Yes. Uh, documents. Yes, yeah, so this is what Oz had suggested, which I totally agree with. Um, on page 14... Um, page 14... Um, <laughs> Book. Here we go. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, on page 14, um, you explain how, like, uh, so, like, even though that this book is, is, like, primarily tailored to a Jewish audience, just in nature, because usually Holocaust books are read by um, Jewish, like, 
uh, people. Like that's just like how it usually is. Um, you mm -hmm. mentioned like in mm -hmm. the prayer, um, you say she had no idea what he said when he was finished. She said, amen. And that's what, um, that's what you did when someone said a prayer, you said, amen. At least she knew that. So, uh, this is kind of why we, we call it a building's Rama. Um, and I was going to explain upon this, expand upon this. Um, but, uh, you kind of feel like, like even as a non-Jew, you can understand the story regardless of your background. Um, like yeah. you kind of, well, I mean, the truth, the truth is I grew up in, uh, not all of my life, but I, I grew up in, for a significant part of my life in a neighborhood that was largely Catholic. Uh, so, yeah, I I would listen to the priest and say, Amen. <laughs> yeah. And there's, uh, there's certain uh, elements of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. There, there are certain elements of the human condition, the human experience that really when put into words, you're able to drag people from no matter what race, religion, ethnicity, part of the world you're from, and really take them on this journey alongside with you. Yes. And uh, it's for that reason that really... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That really stood out. Um, yeah. And like to avoid the length, we picked out like two other ones that really stood out. Um, okay. So for the second one, we have page 108. Okay. Um, and this is the Paya, um, and, and the Seder table. Um, so it kind of like, um, like the imagery in the, in the first paragraph, I'm not going to go because there, there's a lot and, and the language is very rich. So it'll probably take a lot of time to, um, explain it all, but, but kind of like, just like hearing the events. Um, I think again, this is like another gray area that does a great job at outlining the, the black area because, um, you're able to visualize like the joy of everyone gathering around. It's not just like relationships. You had a real life, Kaya. And it's kind of like it's scary, like because you kind of want to detach yourself from real life when you when you read about right. the, the dark parts of here, because right. because like of course, like it, it literally seems like a dystopia. Like you, you don't want to know that you were born in in the same environment as that had occurred in. So when when you paint this real life story, it, it like really whether you want to or not, it pulls you back into reality. Right. Um, right. And it, I, it forces I, I you try to bring those details in there. It's interesting that you picked that up. The, the, the Chopin's etudes and, and all of that there, because I wanted to, there was a real life. It wasn't all, there were people living real lives. Not all, not all of them were, you know, just dying in little huts. There were people in Vienna who owned cafes. There were people who, who were businessmen. I mean, six million Jews plus, actually, that number is so unclear, but yeah, of all kinds, of all kinds. Yeah, yeah, and like, like I kind of like, like um, we're currently, like I'm currently reading The Handmaid's Tale. Um, and- I mean, We both like, are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, this kind of like like does almost a better job because um, in The Handmaid's Tale, the author like it, it is a dystopia, um, and we all know that. But the author tries to make it seem like almost like a reality, right? Um, and and like make some like I think pretty far off connections by by tying like biblical references or things in it to to claim how it's fiction fictionally based on nonfiction which I think actually does a distaste to the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. itself. But um, I think like this, this actually achieves the goal in The Handmaid's Tale. Um, obviously the goals are very different, but I feel as if like um, the fictional story had really made seemed um, non nonfiction or, or based on a nonfiction given the depth I, of it. I really, if you can imagine, oh yeah, well, someone knitting or someone doing intricate work, close work, needlework, needlework. Yeah. Very hard to bring the fiction and the nonfiction together in a way that they worked. Okay. It, 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 there's, I, I'm very thorough person. So the nonfiction that's in here is, is very authentic. 
but I didn't want it to overwhelm the fiction. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. that was a big that was my challenge when I wrote the book. I think you did it. Yeah, job. you did it. You did a great job. You were able to weave in between the fiction and reality and create a compelling narrative. Thank you very much. I that means a lot to hear from two young intellectuals like you. That's what you are. And be proud yeah. of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, then, and then the last one, I think, tying in fictional and non-fictional is on page 259. Um, it's actually chapter 10. Um, it's toward the bottom. And, and right. I don't want to spoil. So if you have not read the book or you don't want to know what is going to happen, please either skip this part of the video or stop watching. And if you stop watching, thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> okay. Now, for those who are still there, um, so when you hear the, the like outcome of the Eichmann case, which is a very true, indeed, trial um, right. that evoked real emotion throughout all of Israel, um, you connect the, this nonfiction event with, with, the, with these fictional characters, with fictional stories, and these characters they feel like this sense of relief that you, you can feel yourself even like throughout their stories. Um, so the, the culmination is very nice because it's not that the fictional story ends and then the story ends, or it's not that the non-fictional story ends and the story ends. It's rather that the non-fictional story ends and the non-fiction impacts the fictional characters. And it, exactly. it, you see that blend between, <laughs> but this you see that He was looking over my shoulder while I was writing this book. But exactly what I had in mind, really, uh, Stephen, is is that I wanted that I wanted that to continue. I wanted it to end, and then and the story, the story to be alive and still move to its natural conclusion. Yeah. 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 Uh, that breath of life, I think, really is impacted by that inclusion of nonfiction and I mean I don't want to reiterate what Steven said but yeah it's really great job great piece of work thank you very much <laughs> thank you and I'd say like um, I want to say like one of the most underrated aspects of this book that I doubt you've ever talked about in any other podcast is is the uh -oh. feeling of is the feeling of the, is the feeling of the cover like like um or the paper like a lot of a lot of times like I pick up a book and and it really matters. Like sometimes like you, you don't want to be licking your fingers every time you have to turn over a page or <laughs> get like a, a paper cut and it, it all, it's not a great experience. Also, um, sometimes like if you, um, here, I just want to get one of my book. Um, so if you, so sometimes like when you, when you, you're cautious on, um, ordering a, a paperback because paperbacks sometimes aren't the best. Um, so for example, right. I have Tuesdays with Maury, with you, which is right. a great book. It's a bestseller. I know but this book. Yeah. This yeah. paper is awful. This bending is awful. It's <laughs> awful. I don't, I enjoy what's inside the book, but it holding it is not great. And, and well, it's, it's very funny. Um, <laughs> Stephen, because my publisher is in New Netherlands, Amsterdam publisher, and it's a modest publisher, you know, a small publisher, that's whatever. So I would say she doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, she has a lot of good taste. Yeah. Uh, her, the covers on her taste. books are very good. I mean, in fact, I couldn't be happier with the feel of this book, uh, you know, she let me do things I wanted to do. I have a little glossary in, in the book, which I added in, uh, put in a, a little short bio. Um, uh, I didn't, I didn't inscribe the book to anybody because to be honest with you, I just wanted it to go out there to everyone. So uh -huh. I, I made that decision. But um, yeah, she did a beautiful job. And, and she even, I must say to her credit, she suggested, I forget, the type was originally white here. And she said, would you think about a light blue? And when 
I put the light blue in. It was beautiful. Yeah. So it was it was a, a team. Yeah, yeah. And I think like yeah. it's really nice. Um, and I know we don't judge books by covers, um, but but I think like no, the, no. The, quote, the quote we don't judge a book by its cover. Not I don't judge a book by its cover. But when I try to judge what's inside a book, the cover sense. matters. The cover matters. And I think the cover, like the feel, like I enjoyed holding this book, reading it. Sometimes I don't. And I have to lie it down on my bed or where it gets. I hope, I hope when you write things that you encourage people. You know, it's up for sale on Amazon. And I would love a million people to buy the book and read it. And write reviews on Amazon, and uh, you know, I don't know how you maybe you put that in your thing, yeah, in the but, description. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll put everything over. Counted numbers. But yeah, we'll definitely we'll definitely have that's some another, of those that's numbers. Another thing I work very hard on the title, the title, the title. So it, the cover, mm. the title. These are all things that take a lot of. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, we'll definitely have them. Like, I, I guarantee that some of our subscribers will purchase the book. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, How wonderful to talk to you. Likewise, this was this was a very in depth view of the book and its intricacies, and I think it's all for the better. It was an amazing read. And yeah, <laughs> you have any like well, uh, final well, comments? All I can say is, since with the small publisher is. If you have used active social media or whatever you do, please give it a push because um, this is not Oprah's book club. <laughs> you know, th this is a very serious, important book that needs to be out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, with that said, uh, we'll leave all the okay. information in the description. Um, Stephen thank you for and watching. I, thank you so much for this interview. And I look forward to seeing whatever you're going to send me or do. Just keep me posted. Of course. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, please like, comment, and subscribe, guys. And thank you for... Uh, I Bye. Bye-bye.